So hi, Julia. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak to me today and uh, to be on the on the Ritzy podcast. So you're uh, a New York Times bestselling more author as well as an editor on Ritzy and a teacher at the uh, San Francisco Grotto. So why don't you give us a little bit of, uh, of background on that? Sure. So my first book is a memoir called Jesus Land that was published in 2005 by a very small independent publisher here in the U.S. And um, for whatever reason, it became a New York Times bestseller and also a London Times bestseller, actually. Wow. Which was, yeah. Um, let's see. And then my second book published in 2012 was about the Jonestown Massacre. So they're both narrative nonfiction books. One, of course, is very personal, being memoir. It's my story. And the other one is more of a work of literary journalism. Right. Got it. And you're also uh, an editor specializing in narrative nonfiction, right? That's right. So I teach memoir and narrative nonfiction. You know, I, I teach locally in San Francisco at the Writers Collective I belong to. I've also, I also teach through Stanford University. Um, and I've been a visiting writer at uh, San Jose State and worked with different universities as well as with private clients more and more. Oh, really? Yeah, directly uh, on an editing basis or on a, on a teaching one? Well, I, you know, I'm a teacher, but I also do private editing and consultation. So sometimes somebody will give me their entire manuscript and I will do a in-depth structural edit. And other times I work as a writing coach, meaning that I help them develop the story that they're trying to tell and, you know, meet with them on a regular basis to go over their work. Right. But you don't go as far as ghostwriting, right? No, I've turned down ghostwriting gigs. I haven't found anything very interesting yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, uh, I, I can imagine. Um, so tell us a bit about this uh, writing collective that you belong to, uh, the Grotto, where you teach. It's it's got a beautiful story, so I'll let you I'll let you I'll let you tell it. Great. Well, so I joined the Grotto in two thousand four when I was writing my first book. And um, the Grotto is a collective of writers. It was started by three friends who were kind of lonely, writing at their solitary desks in their own apartments and decided to start this collective. So they rented a, a, an apartment in a seedy part of San Francisco and, and worked together and, you know, would have fun. They were, they were young and unmarried at the time and, you know, they would go out for drinks afterwards and play. And it was kind of like a little, like a boys club because they were basically all boys at the time. Right. <laughs> but today, uh, after many iterations and moves, we are a collective. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. We're a collective of over 100 people who are either members who have an office at the Grotto or freelance there or are fellows. Um, and it's just, a, it's a great space. It's a great place to be with other writers and network. Um, it's great. I have my little office there that I share with a fiction writer. And it's wonderful just to have a place that you go into and it's, you know, there's no messy house. There is no dishes piled up there's no baby clothes strewn about it's just purely professional writing then we all eat lunch together and we talk about writing and talk about agents and you know run pitch ideas to each other it's just it's a fantastic and supportive environment yeah no i can definitely imagine i can relate to that because like we have startups in the in the in the startup world we also have co-working spaces where we work with other startups and exchange on yeah, classical startup problems, fundraising, growing, etc. And so I, when I came across the Grotto, I, I thought that's that's a great thing for authors, very similar, and I can definitely understand the appeal to that. Do you think that it also fosters creativity to like bring more creative people together that are not necessarily all authors? I, I guess there's other areas as well, right? Yeah, so we're, you know, we're all writers of some sort, storytellers, I should say, because there's also right. radio 
people. There's also screenwriters, but you know, telling stories is what's important. So a lot of times at the lunch table, what we're talking about is the best way to approach a story, you know, possible sources for a story, um, more like creative points. It's, it's a very rewarding and kind of a high-minded place to belong to because these people are obsessed with telling great stories just as I am. So it's, it is, I would say it's, it's very creative. Right. Yeah. And one thing that I've seen is that, so the Writer's Bureau has already written two fun books by all the members in a day, right? Yeah, we've done the we actually just did a third one on writing prompts. Like, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, no, it was cool. So the one of the founders, Pope Bronson, sent out an email call saying, you know, let's write this book. Um, see if we can do it in one day. And he had everybody send in writing prompts. So like creative writing prompts. You know, so everything from memoir to fiction. So it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So we got hundreds of writing prompts, as you can imagine, from all these writers. And we all got paid um, per the question that was accepted into the final book. So <laughs> nobody, nobody got rich, but it was fun. No, that's, so. no, that's definitely a, a, a fun model. And we, we love writing prompts as well. We have a, a specific page for them uh, on, um, on Reedsy, I think. Um, Another thing also, where do you see the, the space going in the next few years? Because it's evolved a lot. You've seen it's, it's, it's really grown. Are there any things that you're going to, any new things that you're going to start? Or how do you see the future of the Grotto? Well, right now, it's a, little, it's a little precarious in San Francisco. Because where we are in the south of Market District, there's a lot of startups and technology companies. So our rent keeps going up. You know, it went up by a third last year. So yeah. we're trying to find ways to to support ourselves and to support, you know, the maybe the fiction writers who don't make as much as a, you know, the the magazine writers or the the big name writers. So we're we're very supportive of each other that way. And one way that we help support each other is that we offer classes through the grotto you know, which are, are great. They're classes taught by working writers um, who specialize in the area that they're teaching, have actually published in the area that they're teaching. A lot of the uh, even universities and other organizations, you know, you can teach, say, magazine writing, even though you may not have published or barely published. We're talking about working professional writers. So that's, that's a great thing. Um, we, you know, we're just we're feeling the squeeze of being creative types in San Francisco, which is going through a huge metamorphosis right now, as I'm yeah. sure you know about. Yeah, and, no, uh, yeah, we're we're gonna make it. We're gonna make it work. We're determined. It's just too good of a community to let it die. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I definitely, I definitely hope you. You make it work, and in some ways, it makes me think of uh, another community in New York, Gotham Writers, right? Yeah. You, you've heard of them. It's it's similar, right? Or I'm not quite sure what Gotham Writers, if they actually are writing collective. I know they offer classes. But I'm not sure. I much. think, I mean, I, if I read the story right, I think they started as well as a kind of writing collective, though they started immediately uh, teaching classes uh, since the very beginning. And for, for the Grotto, it's more... Classes are more of a way uh, to sustain yourself, right? Than a core thing of the Grotto. Yeah, and it's also, you know, the networking is amazing. It's like, you know, I can, I can write an essay or an op-ed piece and I'll send out an email to the mailing list. Who's got a contact at the New York Times op-ed pages? I do. Can you send me the email? It's, it's that type of thing. You know, it's the in personal introductions. You know, I've introduced people to my contacts, say, at the New York Times or other magazines. And, I mean, that is, those are, like, career-changing contacts that you can make there. Yeah, agreed. And, again, very similar to, uh, to the startup space, so I can definitely see what you, what you, what you mean by that. Um, now, if you... We're going to talk a little bit about what you, you teach at the Grotto. So you teach their narrative nonfiction and memoir. We had 
a blog a blog post recently on the on her blog by one of her editors who specializes in fiction who said that she receives a lot of memoirs and she incites the the authors to maybe turn to fiction instead given the competitiveness of the of the memoir genre would you agree with that or of course no. not <laughs> It, at least in the United States, it's um, it's it's easier to get published in memoir. Um, publishers love memoir because there's a true story behind it. So you are a product, quote unquote, that they can then get on television, radio interviews. There's something there. It's not just made up. There's truth behind it, and that's what publishers love. Yeah. No, I don't. But I would. I would totally disagree with that. I, I think that is the appeal of memoir. At least here, there is, it is a crowded market. It's harder to get published. Um, but, you know, if you have an amazing story to tell, or if you are a born storyteller with something insightful to say and can do it in memoir, by all means, that would be the route to getting published. It'd be a much easier than fictionalizing um, your life story into a first novel. Right. No, it's excellent, and that's that's the difference of opinions I uh, I love to see among like professional editors. And of course, if you specialize in fiction or if you specialize in memoir, you're going to think differently and see the market um, differently. And now a, a little question about the the rise of uh, of self publishing and independent publishing, specifically for the memoir genre. How do you see it? Do you think it's a good thing, or would you do you encourage some of the authors you work with to go the self-publishing route, or not? Um, I would always try a traditional publisher first. Right. I I still see self-publishing as you know a little bit of the I hate to say it, but go ahead. A kind of a second-class vehicle. I mean, because you don't have the support of traditional publishers, you don't have the marketing department you don't have the contacts you don't have the distribution channels you don't have you won't be reviewed in the new york times i review books for the new york times and they don't review self-published books because they're still kind of seen as the uh, the ugly stepsister uh, to traditional publishing but that said i do have a former student who published his own book through the peace corps uh, publishing house and he was very savvy about positioning it, about marketing, about reaching out to people who would be interested in reading it. And he did really well. He got, you know, a lot of press, you know, yeah. minor press. Again, this wasn't national publications, but within the the genre, he, he did really well. And it was a great book. You know, so I think before giving up, if it's a option between going with the traditional publisher or not publishing at all by all means you know especially if you are able to work social media and really promote your book in a creative fashion yeah no exactly i mean we don't we we don't advise authors to to self-publish usually but what we do advise them is to is is to choose their path not based on like frustration or uh, because one one hasn't worked out, but depending on their, their objectives. For example, you mentioned reviews. It's clear that no big um, newspaper or magazine is going to review self-published books because there's simply no no curation control in self-publishing. So you don't know if a good if a book is is going to be even slightly good or not if it's self-published. So if you want to have a review, then you should definitely try a publisher. But as you said, if you're good at marketing. And if you want to keep control over your book, sometimes it makes sense to self-publish. Right. Right. And, you know, I think there are, there's a ranking within the self-publishing world. Maybe some independent publishers have some type of promotion or you could hire somebody. But, I mean, really, it's, you know, I would, I would always go the traditional route. Um, yeah. it, that's, but... But, but again, I mean, it really depends what you're looking for. And I can tell you, you know, it's it's a um, it's a hard game to be in writing. I almost didn't get my first book published. You know, all of the major publishers rejected it. Right. Um, 
And then it found its way to that one person who got it and believed it and became its champion. And then this, the ball started rolling and it became a, a surprising success. At least I was surprised. It was reviewed widely, you know, and I, and I still can't believe it. But a lot of times it's finding that one person who believes in your work and who will help, who will be your cheerleader and really help the process along. Yeah, it's about, I think, believing in it until you find that that one person because it's also easy to, to give up after maybe the first few rejections to say, okay, all right, I'll, self, I'll self-publish then. And I, and I always tell authors, don't do that because you've been rejected. Like, if you want a traditional publisher, then you keep trying. And you, if you do it right, you should be able to find one at some point if the, if the writing is good and the query is good. Right. I mean, in the U.S., there's all kinds of independent publishers, not self-publishing, right? So there's like the big five publishers, and there's indie publishers, which are great. You know, there's there's dozens of them, or if not more, who who do a fantastic job editing and packaging your book. I also tell uh, my students and clients is make sure that you're getting some type of feedback. You don't just write your book and submit it, right? You need to get feedback from readers, from a professional. Um, always look for that before you start sending it out to be looked at by publishing people or even agents. Yeah, no, that's that's an excellent point. And I mean, I, I, in the beginning when we started Reedsy, we 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 started a little bit thinking about independent authors and self-publishing authors so that they could have access to great editors from a traditional background. And it turns out that a lot of people who use us nowadays, a lot of authors who use us, um, are looking for an editor before submitting to an agent to get this kind of editorial review that you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Do you get a lot of those as well? Do you think it makes sense for an author to approach an editor before approaching agents? Of course. That's, this is what I do. I hope people, you know, you want to submit your, your best book to an agent or they're just going to turn you down, right? Yeah. So you want to submit it to, you know, you want to have somebody read it, be it your, your friends, probably not your friends. You want to have somebody who can really critique you and give you constructive criticism. So this is what I do with, with my clients is that I work through and I see, you know, what the narrative arc is, what the character arc is, if it's memoir, kind of what the larger theme is, what the best way to begin the book is. The first 10 pages, I spend a lot of time working on those because those first 10 pages are crucial for grabbing somebody's attention you know either in the bookstore online they're going to decide whether they're going to buy this book or not based on those pages so for me it's a lot of fun you know kind of shaping the the book project with my clients i can i can imagine thank you so much for uh, for this advice for the story about the the grotto um i'll as usual, provide a transcript of this conversation on the Ritzy blog and run this shortly. Thank you very much for uh, for your time, Julia. Great. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks.